Welcome to the forge, my wanton wildlings. I'm your creepsmith, and I hope you like my work. Hey, wildlings. One of the things I always wanted to do with my life was uh, be a storyteller. Go figure, right? Turns out, though, not very good at writing. There are things that you pick up on along the way, even if you learn something you're not particularly talented at. Uh, one of those things is the recognition of talent in others. Like tonight. If you're a decent planner and you're good at writing, you can take a series of disparate narrative strands and weave them into a cohesive story that not only continues their individual viewpoints, but also tells a larger tale, like in tonight's telling. The Flesh Interface series by Nine Mother Nine Horse Nine Eyes Nine, posts 61 to 65. 61st post, I-20 West with the devil on our ass. We rode in silence for a while, the Hawa luxury chariot flying along the curves of the interstate as all the other cars obediently changed lanes to let us through. I'd seen people pull access stunts before, like changing the music in a club or turning off the lights in a restaurant, but what she had done was outright sorcery. She had taken control of the elevator, the car, the drone, the other cars on the hallway, all within seconds in real time. She must have had control of all the security cameras to plan our escape. Every one of these feats was a hardened system. The drone was a DOD system, the hardest. But she had based it like child's play. Sitting there in the car, I felt like I was coming down off a high. It wasn't a good feeling. I was sitting in a van with a mass murderer of unspeakable power, and I had helped her, given her access she needed to pull her stunts. She had saved my life, I think, and I had saved hers, but she had also just killed dozens of cops maybe over a hundred. Men with families. Fuck. My life was over. I had helped her. That was a death sentence right there. We'd become the most wanted people in the country. How did I get caught up in this? I looked over at her tiny skeletal body, so frail and weak. I could pick her up and chuck her out the back of the van and and this whole escapade. But then what? Face the death penalty? She had to be my best chance at getting away. But who the fuck was she? She was a killer, that was for sure. Utterly ruthless. A message from her appeared on my set. Sorry about all that. I had to hurry. Sorry. <laughs> that was rich. I asked her where we were going. Upstate New York. What's there? Our objective. What's our objective? A way to defeat Q. Hard to explain. I wondered if she was insane. She was responsive and lucid, but she was also capable of murder. She would probably get rid of me as soon as she could. So you want me to come with you? I'd like it. I need physical help. You killed like a hundred cops back there. The whole world is going to be looking for us. No, they won't. You don't think so? This isn't the feed realm. They take kills pretty seriously in the real world. I do too, but they'll be too busy to look for us. Busy with what? Q. What's Q going to do? You'll find out. T minus four minutes. Just tell me you wouldn't believe me. We fell back into silence. My thoughts were racing. I wondered why they didn't just flag our car or shut down the highway. I guess she was busy working her black magic on the police and transportation systems. 
who knew what she was capable of? Was she really one of the bred, a grown-up child soldier? It was illegal to hook children into long-term feeds, but I had heard stories about China and the FRN connecting infants trying to create people who were utterly at one with the internet. According to the tales, the children all died. So they tried older children, but they all turned into drooling skull baskets. For some reason, the brain needs a certain level of maturity before it can withstand a long-term feed without resulting in total madness. Even then, it results in near total madness. I figured Karen was another child abuse case, but she wasn't just some feed casualty. Her mind worked. Worked well. Whoever had made her had done the forbidden, and they'd done it successfully. But why did I have to get involved in all this? I had just gotten my specialist license. After getting out of the Marines and just drifting around for years, I was finally hitting my stride. Now, that was all fucked up. Don't look back. I looked over to the girl lying next to me. Was it possible that she had hacked so far into infraspace that she could read minds? There was a passing flash of light like sunlight glancing off some car, and then everything around us started to get brighter and brighter like the sun had just come out from behind a cloud, but there weren't any clouds in the sky. The light was coming from behind us, not above, bouncing off the other cars, creating a painful glare. I almost turned around, but then I realized what Karen had said. I closed my eyes against the brightness, and the insides of my eyelids glowed like... And the insides of my eyelids glowed red like I was laying on a beach. After a few seconds, the light dimmed and seemed to return to normal. I opened my eyes, blinked a few times, and turned around. A few miles behind us, the entire city of Atlanta had disappeared behind a megalithic wall of rolling, dark smoke. I felt my mouth falling open. I leaned down to look up at the sky behind us. The giant wall of smoke was just the base of a monstrous black tree of ash that rose miles into the sky, growing larger and larger, looming over the world. Then we were hit by a blast that rattled me right down to the roots of my teeth. I shut my eyes again. The blast turned into a long, horrifying roar. The van wobbled and shuddered as awful groaning sounds passed through the metal. Eventually, the van's steering systems righted us, and slowly the roar passed. That must have been the blast wave of a nuclear detonation that had just destroyed Atlanta. I unbuckled my seat and crawled to the back window, pressing my face against the glass. The tree of smoke was still growing over us, becoming ever more massive. I just stared in the silence. Slowly it changed from one awful form to another until it became a vague gray pillar in the far distance. I'm not sure how long I spent watching it. I know that by the time I looked away, I was crying. 60 second post, the oily ones. I approached the oily ones hiding place with subtlety, alert, not disturbing, letting everything flow through me. I did not search for anything, but allowed it all to reveal itself. The smells were disturbing, awful. I could smell our kind, the mingling scents of multitudes. They seemed to have marked everything without any regard for each other. In front of the portal sat two of our kind. They were monstrously round and swollen, their form distorted. Dull eyes followed me without curiosity as I approached. Even as I came within the dangerous range, they showed no interest. Was it a trap to bring me in close? They did not attack. I passed them and came to the portal. Slowly, I pushed my head through the folding threshold. The inside 
was utterly bizarre, made mostly of box-like shapes and arrangements I could hardly comprehend. There was no grass, no trees, nothing belonging to the form of the world. Instead, there were straight, flat shapes folded around to cover everything, above and below all sides. In the distance, some of our kind were walking around within this odd space, as slow and swollen as the ones outside. The smell was worse than outside, even more confusing. I saw and smelled uncovered droppings everywhere. To not cover droppings was unsubtle. It was a moral outrage. Still, I pushed through the portal and entered the space. The ground was hard and slippery and smelled of legions. Everything was silent, a deeper silence than I'd ever known. I knew now that I was cut off from the world for the first time in my life. I was alone. I moved forward. I wanted to shut out the smells and the sounds, but I let them pass through me. I was terrified, but I let the terror pass through me. I wondered if I was being unsubtle, if I was disturbing the world, if I was inviting deadly misfortune. But I felt no insight in this matter. The answer would make itself known soon enough. As I moved deeper into the space, I came upon a giant oily one. I call her Angelica because she is Angelica. There's no doubt about it. Oh, she looks different this time, but I think Angelica will look different every time she comes to me. She's also much shyer this time. Such a shy little thing. But the way she moves, that pure, lovely way, there's no mistaking it. It is Angelica again. How wonderful. How lovely. Would you think I'm a silly old biddy if I started crying, if I got on my knees right then and there and started thanking God? How he is great. How he has seen fit to bless me. I've been investigating this space and I have found much confusion and monstrosity, but no answers. There is a single oily one which stays here as well as many of our kind. All of them, the oily one and our kind, are monstrously swollen and distorted. The oily one in particular reeks of corruption and disease and death. She cries to me like a lost whelp, but I keep my distance from her. I avoid the others of my kind. This space has many spaces within itself. Each of these spaces holds a thousand mysteries. It is everything I can do not to be overwhelmed, to let the mystery flow through me. Darkness has come and left and I am terribly hungry. The oily one comes to me with food, wonderful food, but I am afraid to take it. I wonder, what exactly am I looking for? I'm looking for some answer to the mystery of the oily ones, but what form will this take? I cannot know. All around me are forms I do not recognize. I must not look for anything. I will simply become a part of this place and let the answer show itself to me. Angelica has been here for over a day but she hasn't spoken to me yet. I think I understand why. The last time she came to me, I was the shy one. I was the one who was afraid of everything, afraid of the world, in despair because of the first time she left. Now, I've been restored, and she's the shy one. It is my turn to help her, to give back. I've tried to give her some of our cuisine, but she hides. I don't think she's eaten anything since she found her way in here. Poor thing. Hunger forced me to come close to the oily one. She set down some food, and I took it, keeping an eye on her. She has an awful fleshy face and giant, pale eyes. She often sings like a bird. Abomination. It was the first time eating the oily one's food since my kitten died. Will, would this food kill me? Only time will tell. 
My form commanded me to eat, so I ate. The food was absolutely wonderful, as the oily one's food always is. I am trying to follow the art of subtlety, but there can be no subtlety in this unholy den of madness. I believe I have investigated almost every place within this giant place. There are many portals in here which lead to various small places. They open and shut in different configurations, but I have watched them carefully and gone into almost every small place yet found no answers. But there is one place I have not yet gone. It is perhaps the only place yet unseen by me. It is the place where the oily one goes when the darkness comes. I think she sleeps there. I heard her making strange singing sounds from within. Frightening sounds. She keeps the portal closed at all time. It only opens for a moment when she goes in and out. I have tried to get a look inside, but have not been successful. I believe there must be some answer within this space. Everything has a form. Every form is a story, and every story must make sense. There must be some reason for the oily ones, for their random kindness, their random cruelty. There must be an answer, and that answer must reside within the hidden space, for it does not reside anywhere else. I will wait. I will go inside. Sweet Angelica is starting to warm to me. We eat together. She's still very skittish, but she shows up promptly at dinner time and eats like a little lady. She doesn't chat with me, but I think she will start too soon. I asked Linda Mercy Chowder to be Angelica's special little friend and to show her around the house. Of course, Linda responds with, Oh, madame, I am too busy with my modeling career. Can't somebody else do it? Meanwhile, the little strumpet flirts all day with Chester Barrington, but that is another story. The oily one came to me again with food, and I found myself crying out to her as if I was a little kitten again, and she was my mother. What has happened to me? How could I regard this horrid creature as my mother? I knew that I would have to become a part of this abomination to unravel its mysteries, but this is too much. I want to leave, to go back to the world, to go back to the fresh air and the light. I must gain access to the hidden space soon, or I will go mad. I am losing myself. Little Angelica is finally talking to me. Now she talks all the time. Mother, mother, I'm back, she says. Oh, I've missed you so much. But I knew you would find me again. You will find me every time. Oh, it's joyful. She's still shy and doesn't let me hug her, but to hear her voice again is such a blessing. I've noticed her following me to my bedroom every night, so tonight I let her in. None of the other ladies or gentlemen are allowed in there, but this is Angelica, so she can sleep with me. She stays in the corner of the room until I fall asleep, even though I sprinkle cuisine all over the bed. I hope that soon we can sleep together like we used to. I finally gained access to the inner space, the space which was to contain all the answers to the mystery which has tormented me for so long. I suppose I have not properly practiced the art of subtlety. I have pushed my way into a forbidden space, snooping and seeking and striving and upsetting things. I suppose it is only fitting that I was greeted with such misfortune. There were no answers in the hidden space, none at all. Just more weird shapes and bad smells. There was nothing that seemed of any significance. I discovered nothing at all. And so, the oily ones remain as much mystery to me as ever. Why are they so monstrous? What is the reason for their kindness? Why do they give us food? Why do we call to them like mothers? 
I guess I will never know. I have fled that awful space, and am gratefully among the trees and grasses again. I will never go back there. Angelica is gone. I haven't seen her for two weeks. She stayed with me in my bedroom one night, and I really thought we were getting closer, and the next day she just disappeared. How could she leave like that? I want to die. I want to die. I can't want to die. I told myself I wouldn't feel this way anymore. I just can't feel this way. No more. I need to call my sister. I need help. What's happened to me? Please, God. I've been lying in bed all day, weeping. All around the room there are pictures of the very first Angelica, my darling girl. In the pictures, she's not sick. She's eating ice cream, learning to swim, playing cards. I showed them to the new Angelica, but she couldn't understand. After all, she's just a cat. To hunt prey, you must simply become an ordinary part of the world. Look around, my darling kitten. What is happening right now? Nothing at all. Yet the leaves rustle, the grass sways, the birds call, the gnats dance. All of this is part of the world, part of the mystery. 63rd post. Bring evil from the other side of death. The old crone became one of our people, and the people soon began to love her. After her bruises and cuts had been healed, she became swirling and bubbly like a young woman. At any time, the people could hear her musical voice babbling on without end, telling stories from different bands of strangers that she had met. It was a long flow of words that could bring anyone into it, even me. She was also very lucky at finding clams, pulling them from the black waters whenever she liked, and she sometimes snuck away from the river and came back with rare treats like snakes' eggs and red beetles. The people did not like to go far from the waters of Mother River. Her protection stayed close to the banks, and the rocky land was known to be stalked by spirits of death, fanged evils which became wolves and lions. Even our little cats stayed close to the alders and the rushes, but the crone had no fear of such spirits and wandered off among the rocks whenever she pleased. The people whispered about this, but it was known that the crone was once a stranger, so it was expected that she would keep strange ways. One day, near the end of the gentle season, the girl Rima disappeared. She was with us in the night and gone the next morning. We searched for her, going up and down the river and sneaking as far as we dared into the rocky lands, but there was no sign of her at all. Some of the women recalled that she had gone with the crone into the rocky lands that day, and at night she had slept near the crone with her two grey cats. Now there was argument among the people. Some accused the crone of taking... Some accused the crone of talking with the spirits of death. Some accused her of being a spirit herself. Others said that she had at least been foolish in bringing Rima out to the rocky lands. I was undecided. I did not like the crone, nor did I trust her, but people often talked about things they did not know anything about. The flute player, Mayad, argued that the crone had been a great friend to the people, giving us three pearls and much food and telling us the stories and songs of the strangers. I knew that the stories and songs of strangers were worthless, but he spoke very beautifully. As the people argued, the crone simply watched us, her shriveled stranger's face making no sign at all, her eyes just as calm as the wide waters. Finally, one of the great men asked her to explain herself. She spoke slowly, in trickling words, and the people became silent as they listened. She said that the same thing had happened to the painted backs, who were the last group of strangers she'd lived with. 
First, a few valuable young women had disappeared in the night one by one. Then, young men were taken. Finally, the painted backs were set upon by another group of strangers, monstrous men as white as cave fish, able to take the form of the eagle and the lion, powerful with evil and cruelty. There was much slaughter, and all were taken away except her, as she was protected by Mother River. This brought great fear into the people. The women whispered and burbled while the men showed their chests to seem brave. One of the great men said that this crone was bad luck, that she had somehow muddled with the evil spirits, that she had brought her disaster onto the painted backs and she would bring disaster upon us. The people agreed. Her journeys into the rocky land had tainted her with evil and we must get rid of her. The crone said that the evil had not come from her and it was not her fault. She said the evil came from Mother River herself. At this, the people became angry. Mother River did not bring evil. She brought the clams and the berries and the cleansing waters, but she did not bring evil. One of the people's great men picked up a rock to brain the crone for speaking against Mother River. The crone showed no fear. She said that Mother River brought both luck and evil. If we were to accept Mother's luck, we would have to accept the evil, but there were ways to increase the luck and lessen the evil. She said that she had tried to teach these ways to the painted backs, but they had not listened, and so they were destroyed. Because they had not heeded her words, their lives and deeds ceased to flow and were dried up into dust. We all scoffed at this nonsense. Nothing like this was mentioned in the deeds of the fathers, so we argued about whether to brain the crone or drown her. In the end, it was decided that we would simply leave her behind. But many of the people grumbled and were unhappy. We left her there at a bend in the river. As we walked away, she made a sign of respect. I expected that she would ask for her pearls back, but she did not. She stayed there by the river's bend, staring into the waters. Later that day, we washed ourselves in the waters to rid ourselves of the evil that had tainted us. In the days that followed, Mother River seemed quiet and sad without the pretty face of Rima and the constant voice of the crone to keep her company. The people wondered if we had made the right choice. The flow of the river was hard to know, and no one could see the cold depths under the glittering surface. But as the days passed and we finished the long song of tears for Rima, things became gentle again. Then another girl disappeared. It was the same as before, gone in the night without a sound. Now we knew we were being visited by evil, but it was not just the old crone who was muddied by evil. Still, we argued whether the crone had brought the evil or not. So much could not be known, and these arguments flowed nowhere. One of the people remembered that the crone had spoken of a way to increase luck and lessen evil. What if she could prevent us from being destroyed like the painted backs? Now, there were many arguments and threats, and one man was almost drowned until he was saved by his women. It was decided that this evil was very powerful, and we would have to surrender to it or be destroyed. There was no choice, so whether the woman was lucky or evil, whether she was helping us or tricking us, we would go to her and do as she said. Killing her would not help. If she could bring evil from far down the river, how much easier would it be to bring evil from the other side of death, which was so close to life? No, we would go to her. I and another man were chosen to go back down the river and find the old crone. She was still at the bend where we had left her, staring into the glittering waters. She smiled as we came to her and asked what we must do. 64th Post Some Thoughts About Addiction Who knows? If you are horribly burned in a fire, you can take drugs to relieve the pain. If you shatter your spine, you can take drugs to relieve the pain. 
if you're addicted to drugs and your life has turned to utter and total shit, you can take drugs to relieve the pain. And that's how the trap works. Imagine if the only cure for burn pain was fire. Imagine if the only cure for back pain was whacking yourself in the spine with a hammer. The drug addict is caught in an analogous situation. The only fast, reliable remedy for the psychological pain of drug addiction is drugs. There are other cures, a notable one is not doing drugs, but they're all slower and less reliable. Somehow, the lure of feeling better now overrides the hope of feeling better later. This is the basic mechanism of addiction. The behavior of an addict is perfectly logical in the short term and perfectly illogical in the long term. Because life exists in the long term, addiction is illogical overall. What's surprising is how easily addiction can ensnare people who are perfectly intelligent and self-disciplined. You can go to certain parts of any sizable city in America and watch drug addicts totter around. Looking at their blighted faces, their filthy clothes, their total lack of self-regard, you'd be forgiven in thinking that they lacked self-discipline. How could you think otherwise? When a person can't be bothered to shower, much less get a proper job or just stop smoking crack for more than a few hours, what else would you call it but a lack of self-discipline? Now imagine the Nazi troops at Stalingrad, encircled by Soviet troops, fighting against total annihilation. Would you look at these troops, these underslept, unshaven men in stinking, unwashed clothes, and accuse them of lacking self-discipline? Would you say, these Nazis are an undisciplined lot. Well, of course not. You would understand that their shabby state is not from a lack of self-discipline, but rather because they are concerned with other things, dire things. While there are several notable differences between the Nazi soldiers and the crackheads, the same principle is in effect for both. For both, there has been a terrible reordering of priorities. The showering, the clean clothes, the job, all of these become secondary to fast access to the drug. If showering and clean clothes got them fast access to the drug, they would walk around looking like a detergent commercial. You'd never see white so white. But they don't need clean clothes. They don't need showers. They need the drugs. The drugs are the solution to everything. Highly self-disciplined people are actually quite vulnerable to drug addiction. It's because they believe they need to control their feelings. They often seek to simply eliminate bad feelings, just as they seek to eliminate underperformance from every other area of their lives. The demon of addiction looks at their grand self-discipline and giggles with glee. It knows that it will be precisely this self-discipline that will bring them to heal. They will self-discipline themselves right into total obedience to the drug. As an example, look at Prince, Michael Jackson. Were they self-disciplined? Definitely. The world has hardly seen such self-discipline since. They were obsessive workaholics, devoted to their careers, and they propelled themselves to the pinnacle of professional success. They both knew the dangers of drug addiction and fastidiously avoided drugs. Keep in mind, avoiding drugs in the 1980s in Hollywood must have been like avoiding water in a swimming pool at the bottom of the fucking ocean. Yet they managed to do it for a while because they had such strong self-discipline. Now, they're both dead. They were both destroyed by drug addiction. In the end, self-discipline just was not enough to save them. Why not? Because self-discipline is just a talent. It's an accomplishment. And like any other talent or accomplishment, it can be turned and made to serve the Dark Master. What then is our defense against this menace? What is the answer? 65th post. A large stewed tomato. Rather ugly. 
It simply appeared in the primitive infraspace one day like a hungry lion showing up on the edge of a village. Over the course of a few hours, it breached a multitude of hardened systems going where it wanted, taking what it wanted, seemingly capable of breaking any form of crypto. Then it disappeared. That was in 1991. More than a decade passed before it was seen again. By the time it reappeared, it had already become something of a legend, in the sense that people scarcely believed that it ever had really existed. Most experts had convinced themselves that the original episode wasn't what it appeared to be, that prime factorization techniques were still secure, that the uh, attacks had actually used fairly mundane techniques. But it came again, and did much as it had before, this time on a larger scale, one commensurate with the more highly developed state of infraspace. Nobody could really be sure that this was the same entity responsible for the original attacks. It was only known that both sets of attacks involved the same almost magically advanced capabilities. Now at least we knew what we... Now at least we knew we were dealing with something real. In the years that followed it appeared sporadically, accessing government systems, defense systems, nuclear systems, RL infrastructure systems, social networks, no latency communities, whatever it wanted. And as the time went on, the appearances grew more frequent. Naturally, the governments of the world were extremely alarmed. A lot of accusations and threats flew back and forth. The activity proved that our best crypto, even our best physical security, was inadequate. But what could be done? We couldn't just roll back the information technology revolution and put everything in manila folders again. So we looked for new techniques to protect ourselves. But it was a lesson in helplessness. It defeated everything we came up with. After the first attack, it began to use a technique of taming satellites and transmitting information to random locations in the middle of the ocean. We trained instruments on these locations and sent ships racing out to find whoever had been receiving all of this stolen data, but they never found anything. Then, one day, an attack occurred, and a tamed satellite began transmitting to a location in the Atlantic just a few kilometers from where a Royal Navy frigate happened to be. When the warship arrived at the location, the satellite was still trying to open a connection with the surface. There was nothing in sight, but they quickly detected a very large object on their sonar coming towards the site. Was it an accident? With all those millions of square kilometers of open water to choose from, would it accidentally choose a location near a warship of all types of vessels? No, I think it wanted us to see, personally. I think it's guided every step of its interaction with us, slowly revealing itself as its powers have developed, slowly drawing us in closer. It's sad. Some of the others believe that we were valiantly struggling against it, but I don't think we were ever struggling against it any more than a brat struggles against a maze. A large stewed tomato, rather ugly. This is how it was described by the skipper, apparently not a poetic man. The video shows an enormous glistening mountain of flesh rising out of the ocean, dwarfing the warship, expelling streams of water out of myriad holes that cover its surface like giant pores. A latticework of huge purple veins run in between the holes, pumping dark globular objects along the structure's surface. The visible portion which emerged above the ocean surface was shaped like a round hump with a slight bridging along the center. The sonar record paints a vague picture of what was beneath the water, apparently an oblong object with a number as many as 12 of thin appendages as long as the main body itself. The conceptual artists of the day produced a great many imaginative monstrosities based on the information. After it surfaced, the warship assumed a defensive posture, meaning it backed off and waited. 
The metallic cylinders appeared shortly thereafter. These were much smaller than the Iwo Jima or Navaya cylinders, but they were much more segmented with thousands of cubic portions flickering in and out of existence like bad pixels. They lasted for 3 minutes and 13 seconds before vanishing as suddenly as they appeared. A moment later, the fleshy mound expelled an enormous geyser of what was apparently air and seawater, like a whale blowing out of its blowhole, and it dived beneath the surface. The warship attempted to give chase, but it was unable to track the object on sonar. It seemed to fragment and disappear. Eventually, the warship returned to the site and took samples of the water. Mixed amongst all the random plankton and fish cells, there was a fair amount of human DNA. In fact, we were able to trace some of it to specific people. And this was how we proved conclusively that this creature, later to be called a skin ship, was related in a literal sense to the so-called Artigas portal, which was actually underwater several hundred kilometers away from Artigas, Antarctica. So in the end, it turned out we had built it. We had built Q. Seriously? Seriously, you want me to top that? <laughs> nah, nah, I got nothing. Thanks for listening, wildlings. Stay scary. Keep clear of the mushroom clouds and make the most of your nights.